All right, let's get started. DJ GPL. Uh, I know you got a live show coming up. We'll, we'll talk about that in, that in a second. Uh, so quickly, for, the, for you guys in the class, again, homework one is due this Friday on the 15th. Project one uh, is out and be due on October 1st. Uh, even though we haven't discussed what a buffer pool is yet, a buffer pool manager is, you can get started if you want. Right? It's, again, just, it's where you're going to allocate memory that gets written out to disk. Okay? Uh, the upcoming events, so next, next Monday, uh, Dana Van Aken will be giving a talk with us, the CMU alumni, CMU Database Group alumni, giving a talk at our seminar series on the, uh, oh, no, 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 I didn't. Okay, sorry. Uh, the, the, um, so she could be talking at the seminar series on Zoom on Monday, and then, actually, before that, DJ2PL is having a concert this, fr this Saturday uh, at 9 p.m. on campus. Uh, in Ragnos in the, in the, in the CUC, the CUC yeah. right. Yeah. Are you letting you sign autographs or no? I mean, let's see, we are still haggling over the price. So okay, yeah. Just the day. CMU is kind of weird. They won't let him, like, like, it's a big show, and they won't let him sign autographs afterwards. <laughs> uh, it's some stupid, yeah. Uh, why don't we do that? So, um, so we have a lot to discuss today, so we, let, we, let's jump right into it. So last class, we were talking about uh, alternative approaches to to the tuple-oriented or slotted page storage scheme that we presented uh, last week. And in particular, we spent a lot of, t lot of time talking about the log-structured storage uh, method, where instead of storing the actual tuples, you store the, 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 the log entries of, of, of the changes you've made to tuples. Uh, and I said that was popular in, in sort of modern systems that are more write-intensive. So the three approaches we talked about, so the, the tuple-oriented slotted pages, the log-structured storage, the index-organized storage, these storage approaches are, uh, are ideal for workloads that are write heavy. I Meaning if you're do doing a lot of inserts, updates, or deletes, right? The log structure one is obviously better for this because you just, again, you're pending to, to the log. Um, and for a lot of applications, or most applications when you start off, or this is, you're, go you're gonna be a, a more potentially write heavy workload. But there's gonna be some applications or some environments or some workloads where Maybe you don't care about getting the best performance for writes. What you really want to do is get the best performance for reads. And therefore, these approaches may not be the, sort of the, the best way to, to, to approach it. So I want to spend a little time talking about what sort of broad categories of database applications look like. And then that'll be motivation for why we want to look at an alternative storage scheme where maybe we don't want to store everything that's just rows, like the tuples uh, with all the attributes together. So this is a rough categorization, um, but in industry, this is, if you study sort of these three, these three uh, you say you're one of these three approaches, uh, people roughly know, know what you mean. Um, so the first category of applications are, are going to be called OLTP, or Online Transaction Processing. And these are applications where you're ingesting new data from the outside world, and you're serving you know, a lot of users at the same time. So again, the, the, the example application I always like to use is Amazon. When you go to the Amazon website, you look at, you look at products, and then you click things, you add them to your cart, and then you purchase them. Maybe you go to your, on your account information and you go update you know, your, your, your mailing address or payment information. Right? Those are all considered old to be uh, style workloads because you're, you're making changes to a small subset of the database. Like you're going updating your cart, going updating your payment information. Right? So think about you know the, you know think of like posting things on Reddit or Hacker News right those are making small changes which potentially could be a large database but the, the amount of change each query or operation is making is small the amount of data that they're reading is small they're reading, reading a, for a single entity. So contrast this with online analytical processing or OLAP workloads where this is where I want to use uh, I'm going to run queries that that are going to extract or extrapolate new information f across the entire data set. So this would be like Amazon running a query that says, find me the number one sold product in the state of Pennsylvania on, on a Saturday when the temperature is above 80 degrees, right? It's not looking at a single person or not looking at a, a single entity, but it's looking across the entire table. It could potentially doing a lot of joins also, you know, with, with additional, get additional, additional information similar to the things you guys have done in, in, in homework one. Right? And so in these OLAP workloads, they're going to be primarily read-heavy or read-only. Right? I'm not doing single updates. I'm going doing large scans of, and joins over uh, big tables. 
And this last one is sort of a, a, sort of, it's a, a buzzword in, from the industry analyst, Gartner, uh, called HTAP. And this is basically, there's some applications where you want to do both the L2B style workloads and the OLAP workloads uh, potentially in the same system. So instead of having to me take all my transactional data, put it into a separate data warehouse, uh, and then do my analytics on there, uh, maybe I could do some analytics directly as the data comes in. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this sort of throughout the semester, but the, the main two ones you want to focus on are OLAP and OLAP. Another way to think about the distinction between them is uh, sort of a simple a grid like this, where along the, the, the x-axis, I'm saying whether the workload is read-write-heavy versus read-heavy, and then the y-axis says how complex the queries are. Right? So you can sort of divide it up like this. OTP would be down in this corner, because we're doing potentially a lot of updates, uh, but the queries we're going to execute are going to be really simple. Like go select, single, you know, go select star from, any, from the account table where you know, ID equals Andy. Right? It's going getting, in sing, get, going getting single things. OLAP would be on the opposite end of the spectrum here, uh, where again we're doing mostly writes and the writes were, sorry mostly reads, and the reads the select queries are going to be executing are going to be uh, uh, much more complex than we do in the OTP world. Think of like Q9, Q10 in homework one. So OLAP, the OTP term goes back to the 80s. Uh, OLAP comes from the 90s. Uh, this guy that, named Jim Gray, was a famous database researcher who, who invented a lot of the stuff when we talk about this semester. He wrote an article saying, hey, there's this new category of workloads in, in the early 90s called OLAP, and we should pay attention to it. Um, turns out he was actually getting paid by a company who was trying to sell a OLAP database system product in the early 90s, and the paper got retracted, uh, but the name still stuck around. And then Jim Gray won the Turing Award in databases in, I think, 96. Right? He's, he's a very famous database researcher. And has anybody heard this story? No. Has anybody heard of Jim Gray before? It's one, sort of. Okay. So he famously got lost at sea in the San Francisco Bay in 2006. He was out sailing by himself. It's not a joke. Uh, he was out sailing by himself, and, and his boat disappeared. Uh, and this is actually one of the early uh, examples of crowdsourcing because they actually moved satellites to take pictures of the San Francisco Bay and try to, you know, people look at the images to try to find the boat, and they never found him. Right? Um, all right, so then that's a weird uh, tangent, but uh, yeah, he, I, I never met him, but like a lot of the, you know, we talked about like, you know, going to Pluto versus reading, you know, reading the book in front of you. You know, that was a Jim, Jim Gray metaphor. He had a lot of interesting things like that. All right, so HTAP would be sort of in the middle. So, I, so today I want to spend time talking about uh, why the things we talked about so far in the, the, the previous two lectures, they're going to be good for, for OLTP and not OLAP, and then we'll design a... A, a storage scheme that is better for OLAP. So to do this, we're going to do a real simple uh, example using uh, a real, real database. So this is, uh, this is roughly what the, the Wikipedia uh, database looks like. It's open, it runs a software called MediaWiki. It runs off of MySQL uh, and PHP. Like, it's open source. You can go look at it. And the, 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 the schema roughly looks like this. Right? There'll be user accounts, people that are actually making changes. There'll be pages, like the articles in Wikipedia. And then there'll be revisions for those, those articles. And so there's a foreign key of reference for a revision. You have the user that created the change and then the, uh, an ID to, to the actual uh, rep, the, the, the page itself. But all the text itself is going to go in, in the revision part. Right? And there's a, there's, a, there's a foreign key going back from page to revision so you can, so you can find the latest, la latest revision. So I've said this before and I'll say it again. The relational model does not define or specify that anything about how we should store the data in, in a table, right? And so in all the examples I've shown so far, we're just showing the tuple, every tuple, all the attributes one after another. Yes, we said there was overflow pages for large attributes, but uh, you know, that's, that, that's a, in general, all, the, all the, the smaller attributes will be stored together. But there's nothing about, again, the relational model that says you have to do that. It's just sort of what we as humans came up with first. It's easy for us to conceptually think about. But again, for OLAP workloads, this may not be the best thing. So let's see how it works for, for, for OLTP, right? For, again, for OLTP, it's going to be a bunch of small queries that are going, sorry, it's going to be a lot of queries that are going to be really simple, and they're going to read or write a small amount of data relative to the, all the data in the database, right? So the first query here is just go and get the, for a given page, given, given its page ID, go get me the, the latest revision for it. So it's a join against the revision table, but it's one page and one revision. 
it's, it's retrieving that. The next one is the update query is somebody logging in, you know, you have a user ID, assuming they've been authenticated, and you update the user account with the timestamp of the last time they logged in and the host name from where they logged in from. Or if I do an insert into the provision table, it's, it's inserting a single row, right? And this is what usually people end up with when they build a brand new application. Like if you're, if you're, gonna, you know, if you're gonna create a startup and you start building some online service, you usually end up with something that looks like this because you don't have any data in the beginning. You need to get it and you make a website and then your website's gonna run these kind of queries. Again, for, and for OLAP, we're gonna do more complicated things that require us to look at larger portions of the table. So this is actually a, a rough approximation of a real query where people were running, um, uh, you, you would look at the user accounts in Wikipedia and you find all the, the, the login attempts from, from users that were, had an IP address or a host name that ended with .gov, right? Because like a, there was a scandal late 2000s, early 2010s where like, uh, people in Congress were having their staff go update Wikipedia to say more flattering things about you know, the congressman or congresswoman, right? Mike Pence did this, Joe Biden did this, right? Uh, so this query could find all people that, that were doing that. So we basically were paying government employees to go update Wikipedia. Uh, and they shouldn't have, right? Again, so this is queries we're going to execute on data after we've already collected it from, from sort of the old OTP portion of the application. So th the thing we need to talk about now is what I'll call the, the, the storage model. And this is going to be how the database system is going to physically organize tuples in, in disk and in memory relative to their other tuples and their own attributes. Um, and so up until now, again, I've been assuming that all of the attributes are contiguous for a tuple, and that's sort of roughly called a, a row store. Um, but again, for OLAP, that actually may not be the best thing, and we'll see why in a, in a second. And the reason why we have to discuss this part of a system, because there is a clear distinction in the marketplace now or in, 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 in the database world between a row store system and a column store system. Like a row store system, you'd want to use that for OLTP, and for a column store system, you'd want to use that for OLAP. And if anybody tries to say, hey, I have a fast uh, row store that you can use for analytics, uh, you, know, you should be very skeptical. All right, so the three choices to do are the, the NRE storage model, or NSM, that's the row store. Decomposition storage model, DSM, that's the column store. And then a hybrid approach is actually, this is the most common one for column stores. Well, we'll see why in a second. Uh, it's called PACS, or partition attribute across. Um, and most time people say they have a column store, they really have the PACS one. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a major, major, ma major difference. Okay? All right, let's start with the first one, the NSM or row store. And again, this is what we've already said so far this semester. We assume that all, almost all the attributes for a given tuple are going to be stored contiguously in a single page, you know, with one attribute after another. And the idea is, again, you're going across in the page and you're laying out all the, the data for a given tuple, and you don't start anything, you don't, you don't lay down any bits for the next tuple until you finish the, the current tuple. And the reason why this is going to be better for an OTP system, is, as I already said before, OTP application, is that most of the queries are going to be accessing a single entry or single tuple, right? And so now I can go to a single page and get all the data I need for that single attribute. And that's, that, that's really all I need for, for, to satisfy that query. And we've already talked about page sizes, but again, it's always going to be some m multiple of, of Harvard pages. So this is basically the same layout that we saw before, right? That we have some database page, we have a header in the front with a, the, slot, the slot array, and then as we start scanning through our table and want to start or, or scanning through the application, which starts inserting data, it's just going to go append the entries to the end uh, and keep, keep adding, adding more and more uh, and then till, till the thing gets filled up, right? And again, now if any query comes along, it says, you know, select star from this table uh, where ID equals something, we need to go to get this one page, jump to the offset as defined in the slot array, and we get all the data that we need. So let's see now in our, how this works in a Wikipedia example. I right, say so have a query here where someone wants to log in. Yeah, right? They're passing in a username and, and a password. Right? So we're just checking to see whether that matches. This is roughly how you log into a, a database-backed application. Or using, if you do authentication database, it roughly looks like this. And again, so we can ignore how we actually find the data that we want for, this, for one given user, but assume there's some kind of index, hash table, B plus tree, it doesn't matter. We'll cover that in lecture eight. But there's a way to say for this, this, you know, for this user account, 
here's the record ID and all set. So now we go in our page directory and we find the page that has the data we're looking for. We look in the slot array, we jump to some offset, and now we have all the data that we need for this query, query and we, we can produce the result. Again, so this is ideal for OTP because all the data is just contiguous. Same thing we want to do an insert. All we need to do is look in our uh, page directory, find the, uh, a page that has a free slot, go bring it to memory, assume it's this one, uh, and then you know, append it to the end of it. Right? That's fine. But now if I try to run that query before, again, where I'm trying to find all the, get, get the number of times people have logged in per month if they end with a host name with, with .gov, uh, now you see in this case here, I got to scan all the pages in the table because you know, I, I need to look at everything, all the user accounts. And then when I bring a page in, the, the way we're going to roughly execute the query, we haven't got through how to do query execution yet, but the roughly idea is that we got this where clause thing that's look up on host name. We, so we need, to, we need to go find the tuples in the page that, where that, that, that predicate on the host name is satisfied. So the only data we really need to look at is just the host name here, right? Then we got to do the, the aggregate uh, on the last login uh, for the group by. Um, and so that means the only data we really need to look at for that portion of the query is just these attributes here. So what's the obvious problem? You have to go through all the rows, and you brought a bunch of data in that you actually don't need, right? So in order to get just the attributes I needed, I had to bring in the entire page. But the entire page brings on a bunch of attributes, user ID, username, user pass, that I don't need for this query. So I'm basically doing useless I.O. I'm fetching data in from disk, and I don't even need it at all. Right? So not only is that slow, but in some systems, you pay per disk IOPS. Right? In Aurora on Amazon, you pay f if you read something from disk, you pay per the number of I.O. operations you're doing for a query. All right? So in this case here, I'd be paying for data that I, that I don't actually even need. So that's the obvious problem with, with NSM. Again, great for inserts, update, deletes. Great for queries that need to get the entire, all the data for, a, for a, a single entity in the database. But if you want to scan large portions of, of a table and you only need a subset of the attributes, which most OLAP queries uh, only need, right? It's very rare for you to call a select star on a, on a really wide, huge table because you're basically dumping the whole thing out, right? There's utilities to make that go faster other than the select star. So this is going to be bad for OLAP because we're, we're bringing in data that we don't need. The, we, this is sort of low-level detail, but going back to this, this portion here, like if you think about how you would actually execute the query to do this, to, 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 to run this predicate, I'm jumping around to different locations in, in memory to, to do my scan, right? So like, I got to read this header for the first tuple, figure out where, you know, how far I need to jump over to get the host name. Then I can maybe look at the last login event if I'm computing aggregate as I go along. But then I jump down to the next tuple and then jump over that to get, get to, the, you know, to, to its hostname attribute. So in a modern superscalar CPU, this is terrible because there's a bunch of these non-sequential operations that could also become non-deterministic where uh, I, my memory locations that I'm accessing is, is going to be sort of, it's not random because you're always going in, in increasing order, but it's not going to be like I'm just reading strides of memory and, and crunching through it very quickly. That's a low-level detail that we don't really cover in this semester, but it's, it's at least worth uh, discussing. And then we'll see this, at, uh, we'll cover compression later in, in, in this lecture, but in this case here, we're not going to be able to get a you know, good compression rate if you want to reduce the amount of, or pack in more data within a single page because all the attributes for a given table are just thrown together in that page and there's no, there's going to be less chance for repeatability or less chance for identifying, hey, these, these values are the same, I can compress them really well. Right, again, just going back, we have, we have a user ID, that's going to be integer, uh, Username is going to be a random string. User pass random string. Right? It's going to be all sort of different uh, value domains, and that's not going to be ideal for compression. All right, so the alternative approach is the DSM, the, the columnar storage decomposition storage model. And the idea here is that instead of storing uh, all the attributes for a single tuple together in a page, we're going to store all the attributes for all tuples. Sorry, for, a, for all tuples, we're going to store a single attribute in a single page. 
right? I just have that, that last login field. Instead of having all intermixed with, with the other attributes, within a single page, I would only just have that login, last login uh, attribute. And this is going to be ideal now for OLAP queries because they're going to scan the entire table and only for only a subset of the attributes. And now when I go fetch a page from disk, I'm only getting data. I know I'm only getting data for the, has the attributes that I actually need and not for other things that just so it's, sort of gets carried along for the ride. So the, again, the benefit of a declarative language like SQL is that you don't have to know and don't have to care whether you're running on a row store system versus a column store system. Your same SQL query works all just fine, just the same. Uh, but now it's the database system's responsibility, meaning us, the people actually building it, it's, it's our responsibility to, be, to take data, split it up into separate columns, separate attributes, and then stitch it back together to, to when we need, need to produce results. All right, so this is just another, the same diagram I showed before. Again, the way to think about this is that for the first column here, first attribute, column A, we will have a separate file with a bunch of pages. It'll have a header now, just because it'll you know, tell us what, what's, in, what's inside the page. And then now we'll have this, the null bitmap for all the columns, sorry, for all the values within that, uh, within, within this column, followed by now the contiguous values for all the tuples in the table. And we just do it for the next one and the next one. All right? And so these are still, be, these files will still be broken up as, as database pages like we talked about before. So either four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, whatever, whatever the system supports. But the, the file itself will contain, um, again, just, just the data for a single attribute. And now the metadata overhead for these different files is actually much less than, a, than in a row store because I don't have to keep track of like, all additional, like, uh, uh, every, single co every single column, whether it could be null or not, uh, the, the different information about the offsets or where to find things. Right? These are all going to be... The metadata at the store, because it's just all the same value domains or all the same attribute type, is going to be much less than, than a row store. All right, so the idea here, again, so we go back to our Wikipedia example. We just take the, the sort of every column for, for our table, and then we're, we're going to store that as, as a separate page. Right? So if you, if you go back to the, you know, for the hostname example, within a single page, again, we're only storing values for the hostname column. And we'll have separate pages for all, all our attributes. So now, if we go back to this, 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 the OLAP query here, again, we're doing the lookup, the counting the number of logins per month with the, for government addresses. The first part executing the query is going to get the host name. Well, that's assuming it's, it's one page per attribute. That's going fetching that one page and then doing the scan, just ripping through the column and identifying all the matches for that, uh, for that host name. And again, I have hundred, complete utilization of all the data that I brought in because I'm only bringing in the data I need for, for this query. I'm not bringing in attributes that I don't care about. And then now, we'll talk about this later, how we do, uh, when we talk about query execution, how we, how, we, how we match things up. But assuming I keep track of a list of here's the offsets of the tuples within this column that match my predicate, then I go to now to the, the last login page, go fetch that, and again, that only has data that we need, and then now I know how to jump to the different offsets of the matching host names to find the right offset for the login, uh, the, the login timestamp, and then compute whatever I need for the query. So this is clear. Who here has heard of column storage before today? Yeah, less than ten percent. Okay. Again, so th this is a. Um, it sort of seems obvious now. That this is clearly the way you want to do this, but uh, before. Up to like 15 years ago, even 20 years ago, right? This is not how any database system was actually built. It was very, very rare. Yes. In the row store, to do like the where, do you still have to look through all the like every single row to like find it? Because like you know what ID is, but you don't necessarily know like where like it matches. Uh, sorry, your question is if I go back to the the row store example. Um, this one here. So your question is what? Sorry, if if even in this one, do I have to? Oh, like this this one. Yeah. The, yeah, that one. Literally this. Okay, yes. Yeah. It, why? Sorry. What's, what? How do you know the index from like that where clause? Like, 
does it know where that username and password equals is? Oh, okay. So this question is, I said there's some index. I didn't say what it was. There's some magic way to say, look at the where clause where it says username equals something, right? Because you, you would build an index on username. And I magically got to the single record. That, again, the record ID, page ID, and offset. How did I do that? That's what the index does. That's next week, right? It, it's just a key value. Uh, you can think of a key value map or associative array. For a given key, the username, give B the record ID or record IDs, if it's non unique, that match this. Then I, then, so I get that. My index gives me the record ID. I look at my page directory, said, OK, I need page 123. Where's that? It's, on here, it's either in memory or on disk. I go get it. And now I have the slot number from the record ID. And I look in that page and jump to that slot to get, get what I need. So that allows me to jump exactly to the page I need. And then within that page, go to get exactly the record I need. But again, like I only need one, one assuming usernames are, are unique, I only need one username. Uh, so, but I had to go fetch all these other rows I don't actually need. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, just to understand, like the only difference between a column based, like the only disadvantage a column based would have is slightly more implementation on the DBMS side. Uh, what do you mean by slightly more implementation? I mean, your DBMS has to be more intelligent because now it has to keep map of different columns and stitch them together. Wherein in a row based, you don't really care. You once you have the access of the whole row. You can compare the host name, you can compare the login at a single instance, wherein if you are doing it column based, you will have to have some more intelligence to understand uh, what I'm putting out because I'm matching two different columns. I would say they're equally as hard. Uh, if you don't care about other bunch, bunch of other protections, uh, like we, we're not talking about transactions, but like if you don't care about those things, uh, then yeah, I, I would agree that like a row store would be easier to implement. Yeah. Um, because again, you just like all right, everything's here. Assume it all packs in. Then yeah. Then assuming that every record can fit into a single page, ignoring overflows, then a row store would, would be potentially easier. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the fact that like the data stored and like row centric or column centric is it configurable by like table or is like a property of the entire database? So this question is: the, uh, is the fact that a is it should should the data system store is it a row store versus a column store? Is this something that's configurable by table? Or is this, it's sort of all or nothing. So most systems are going to be row only or column only, right? Uh, the, the HTAP stuff, the hybrid stuff, it sort of tries to do sort of, sort of both. Um, the, so typically, you would say, yeah, so in, in, in most systems, you would say, all right, I know I'm using this system. It's going to be a column store. So I'll store everything in there. Right, it, it all be, the, t the tables will be colum columnar. Now, uh, even though I said like the like, even though it's a it's a column store, and uh, we're going to be optimized for for, for read only queries, people obviously want to update data, right? And so the way you typically get around that is these systems would have a a sort of row store buffer area, and it typically is log structured where. If I have any updates, I apply them to that row, row portion, and then periodically I would then merge them into the column store. Right? That's one approach to this. Uh, Oracle does a different approach where the row store is considered the primary storage location of the database, but then they'll make a copy of, of your tables in a column store format. And they, they're responsible for keeping the sort of things updated for you. So there's a different approach to these different things. But typically, uh, if the system supports, I want a row store versus a column store, you, you, you could define it on a per-table basis, but m most systems don't do that. Yes? Uh, when you're using a column store system, hypothetically, if you have uh, the number of as many disks as you have files for every uh, column, uh, would your writes and updates be as fast as a row store? So this question is, if I have as many disks as I have columns, assuming I break up in a column store a table, and every attribute goes to a separate goes to a separate disk, would that be as fast as a row store? Uh, well, no, because you'd have to, you still have to do that, that, that splitting apart and writing it all out, right? And then you also would have more pressure in memory because, uh, again, say I, I have a, a thousand attributes. So now if I have to update a thousand pages, I got I to have a thousand pages in my buffer pool to do the update to put, you know, the, the each, each, updating each of them with a new single attribute and then write them all out. Right. Typically, again, doing updates in a in a in a 
in a column store system without this sort of buffer thing I just mentioned is always going to be slower. Yes? Uh, her question is, what is a, the null bitmap and zero equivalence in, uh, in, uh, in rosters? Yeah, we discussed this last class. It basically, um, it's a way to represent which attribute is null, right? So I'm not drawing here, but I, they had the diagram last class. In the header of, of every row, there'll be a bitmap that says uh, which attribute is null or not, right? That's one approach to do it. That's the most common one, right? You could do this. We had to talk about the special value, or in each attribute, you could have a little flag in front of it. Right, the null bit that basically says attribute, you know, for this tuple, attribute one is null, attribute two is null. And so think of that, instead of having it, that bitmap per, in the header per tuple, in the column store, it's just for the entire column, here's the null bitmap. Yes? If for an index in a column store, is it instead of this, like, here's where to find this one row, it's here's where to find, like, these 10 columns? His question is, in a column store, in a store, what does the index actually do? So some systems, some, some OLAP systems that are column stores, you don't get any indexes. I don't think Snowflake gives you an index. You can't, you can't create one. It might have changed. Vertica, you couldn't have indexes, right? Uh, because again, they're not trying to do like point queries or single, single thing lookups, right? It's, it's to do complete scans. Um, and so now the other point, and you're correct, like you could have indexes that are uh, range indexes. Right, so here's where to go find if your if your ID is when zero and hundred go to this page, right? Or you know, there's there's things like that. There's inverted indexes like find me all the the records where the keyword Andy exists, right? And that doesn't look like a tree structure. That's usually a hash table. Like there's different types of indexes, but you would not maybe you wouldn't have the index to do point query lookups. All right, cool. So um, let's jump back. All right, so I was kind of hand wavy about this part here, where I said, OK, let me go fetch the page that has the host name, run my where clause, I'll get a bunch of matches, and then let me go fetch the last login page, and then I had a magic way of finding the matches there. Right? How did I do that? Well, there's two approaches. The most common one is to do fixed length offsets. And that means that the, the, you identify rows not by a slot number, but you identify you know, unique tuples. This is why I, I don't want to say row versus, like, instead of tuple versus record, because uh, like, what does a row look like in, in a column store, right? It's, tuple is the better term. But the, the unique identifier for a tuple is going to be its offset within the, the table. So now, if I'm at like offset three in one column, I would then know how to do, you know, jump to the offset three in another column, and then I can stitch that tuple back together. But again, this only works if the, the values are fixed length. Of course, what breaks that assumption? Variable length, var charts, strings, blobs, text, right? So we'll talk about how to handle that in a second. So that, 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 this approach, the fixed length column one, that's the most, that's the most common one. Uh, a legacy approach is to use embedded IDs where with every single value, you have some unique tuple identifier, like, you, you know, sort of like the log structure stuff, like it was some counter in, in, be, being incremented by one. And then there's some index structure that I'm not showing here where for a given record ID, for a given column, it tells you where, where to jump to this. Uh, this is rare. Uh, it, I probably shouldn't even mention it, but like, it is one way to do it. There was some system, I forget, in the old days that did do this because they were kind of like contorting a row store to make it a column store. Um, but everyone, everyone uses fixed length all sets. Of course, the problem you got to deal with now, again, is, the, is how to convert variable length values into fixed length values. And we think, I guess, how you do that. Yes? Pointers, maybe? He says pointers. Pointers to what? Yeah, so for every column, sure, every date is also contiguous. Uh, yeah, that would yeah, that actually would, would potentially work. The problem with that one is like if you have to do like in place updates, right? If you're just packing all the data in, if it's if it's not if it's immutable, you don't have this problem. But if it if it is mutable, then you have you could have fragmentation. So slot arrays again. He says slot arrays. 
but, but what's, what's it pointing to? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, but that's, that's sort of similar. What he was saying, that, that potentially would work. Compression. Right? So the, 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 the point approach, that, that would work, but I don't think anybody does that. Um, you could just pad things out, but that's going to be wasteful, as we said before. But this is basically how dictionary compression works. Right? Dictionary compression is, is replacing some, some variable length value with, a, with a, an integer code, which is, which is going to be fixed length and it's usually 32 bits, uh, that we can use to, uh, to, to then do some predicates on the dictionary code. And if necessary, if it matches something we're looking for, go do a lookup and find, find what the actual value is. And that's a typo. It's not more in this next week. It's more in this, more this hour. Like, we, we'll discuss this now. So sorry. Um, right? So that's how we're going to be able to get, solve this problem. And this is pretty much the way everyone does it. Uh, in a minor system. So this column store idea is not new. Uh, according to the literature, the very first version of this uh, goes back to the 1970s. There is this project out of the, the Swedish Defense Ministry called Cantor. It was more of a file system than a, than a d database system. But this is considered to be the first documented like, proposal for a column store system. And I, I don't know whether it, it, it exists today. In the 1980s, there was a paper that actually d sort of mapped out the theoretical properties of what the decomposition storage model looked like. Um, but again, it was still mostly only, only in academia. The roughly what's considered the first commercial implementation of a column store system was this thing called Sybase IQ, but it wasn't really a full-fledged database system. Uh, it was more like a, like a query accelerator. And so sort of similar to what I was saying before about Oracle, they make a copy of your row store into a, an in-memory column store. This is basically what Sybase was doing back in the 1990s. So your query would show up, and then Sybase would figure out, should I go to the, the row store and maybe do something there, or should I just run the query only on the, uh, the in-memory column store? In the 2000s is when, is when the column store stuff really took off. And the three sort of key systems in this space were Vertica, which is in... Uh, Founded by my Peachy advisors, Stan Zanotic and Mike, Mike Snowbreaker. Um, Vectorwise was a, a out of was a fork of MoniaDB, but that, that, that was out of CWI, uh, and, and MoniaDB was 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 a, a major academic project at CWI as well. Um, DuckDB is from CWI, so the the first version of DuckDB was actually called MoniaDB Lite. They threw all the code away and then started DuckDB from scratch after learning about the MoniaDB Lite. Vectorwise was started by uh, some people that worked on MoniaDB. Um, and then the, the, the two main people at Vectorwise, one of them left and was a co-founder of Snowflake. Right? So a lot of the early ideas that Vectorwise developed is in Snowflake. And then uh, the other guy, Peter Bontz, he went back to CWI and then he you know, helped him advise the, the DuckDB project. So there was a bunch of other systems at the time, but I consider these the three major ones and the pioneers in this space. Um, and actually, how this all sort of came out, the way Mike tells it was, uh, or Schoenberger tells it, he was consulting for Walmart Labs uh, in the early 2000s, and they were struggling trying to scale their uh, Teradata database, which at the time was a row store. Right? I think Walmart was, it was, it was a, you know, multiple petabytes. It was, it was a database of every single transaction. Anytime somebody bought something at a store, like scans something the cash register, it was in that database. And they were struggling to get Teradata to run fast. And then Mike was like, "Oh, we should make, just make this a column store." And then he, uh, you know, and, and then he, he, he founded the C store project that became Vertica. And then, uh, you know, it was a pretty famous project. Anyway, now pretty much everybody does this. Uh, so, you know, this is just a, a sample of the a bunch of different database systems that are out there that, that are considered column stores. Um, but the two key things that are also interesting about the 2010s is there's these open source uh, file formats, Parquet and Orc. Parquet came out of Dremio and uh, somebody else I'm forgetting. Uh, and then Orc came out of Facebook. Right? These are open source co uh, file formats that are col columnar based. Um, and now you can build database systems that can read and write uh, yeah, Parquet and Orc files. All right. So the advantages for the, the columnar or de decomposition storage model is that 
We're going to greatly reduce the amount of wasted I.O. we have to do for analytical queries because we're only reading the, the exact data that we need, right? Um, and we're going to get better cache reuse and better locality for our access patterns because, again, we're literally just going to rip through columns one after another and not have to jump around uh, within, within memory, which is better for CPUs. And again, we'll get better compression, which we're coming up to. Because the downside is going to be it's going to be slow for point queries, slow for inserts, update, deletes, because we're going to have to split things up uh, and write out multiple, you know, data to multiple locations and then bring it back in if we want to put it, put it back together. Yes? In the previous slide with the history, did Subway build their own like, database? question is, did Subway build their own database? No. It's a, consider that an Easter egg. Um, but <laughs> PancakeDB is real. That's a real system. OK. So one thing to point out, though, is that in my, my earlier example, the way I showed, I ran that, that one query, I did the scan on the, on the, um, on the, on the, the, the host name you know, uh, column. And then I ran the scan portion of the query on the, uh, on the login one. And you sort of think of that like it was, I did one, and then I moved on to another. In a lot of cases, though, queries, you actually want to look at multiple columns at the same time. Right? My where clause only had, was only referenced one attribute. But as, you, as you've seen in, in the queries you've written for homework one, oftentimes you have multiple columns or multiple attributes referenced in your where clause. And so it would be kind of, it's kind of expensive or cumbersome to sort of now be ma maintaining uh, as I'm scanning along one column fetching in another column at the same time and trying to, trying to patch things together. And so we still want, we still don't, we want to be able to have data, or we, we want a way to have the attributes that are somewhat, that are going to be used together somewhat close to each other on disk or in our files, but still get all the benefit of, of a column store layout. Right? And so this is what the PAX model, model is. Uh, well, again, and, and as I said, in most systems, they say they're a column store. They're really doing this. Parquet and Orc are really, really doing this. And the idea is not like, you know, mind blowing. It's just basically saying instead of having a separate file for every single at column or attribute by itself, I'll have the, uh, I'll break them up into chunks, uh, into row groups, and have data that are you know, within the same tuple close to each other. You know, in the same file, just sort of spaced out in separate pages, right? So we go back to our, our sort of mock example here. All we're going to do is just horizontally partition the table uh, into uh, to, to row groups, and then within that row group, we're going to partition it based on columns, right? So you think of this: the, the first three rows here, I'll have some portion in my giant file. My uh, I'll define the row group. I have a header for that row group. And then I have all the attributes of column A together, then all the attributes for column, or all the values for column A, all the values column B, followed by all the values column C. Right? So now, again, if, if I have a where clause that needs to access you know, both column A and column C, when I go fetch these pages for this row group, I, you know, I, I have all the data for the, that I need close to each other. But I'm also getting the benefit of sequential I.O. because this row group is going to be you know, in, in the tens of megabytes instead of like, you know, four kilobyte or eight kilobyte pages. Right? Same thing with the next guy and so forth. And so this is roughly how Parquet and Orc work. Uh, there's a lot of diagrams or, or you know, uh, or presentations of what Parquet and Orc look like. Uh, and again, they, they're basically using all the same language that, that we're using here. Right? And here they say the, the default size of a page is one megabyte because they want to have, you know, group things together and have you know, as much sequential I.O. as they can. And then a row group is going to be 100, 128 megabytes. OK? Yes? Will this suffer from like, the same problem where you're kind of doing like, a bunch of duplicate I.O.s after doing like, a full thing? The statement is, couldn't this also have those? Are you still going to have the problem where you have a bunch of useless I.O.s uh, if you're doing a full table scan? So the header tells you where things are, right? And because it's so huge, like I could bring in, I bring in this first header here. Actually, I'm showing the header, but like in, in real systems or in parking org, it's actually at the footer because assuming the file is immutable. So I don't know what like I don't know what the, where everything's going to be until I finish writing it. So it's in the footer, but that's a, that's a that's an aside. So his statement is, don't I have the same problem as the row store here if I'm doing this packs thing because uh, now if I bring this entire row group in, 
am I going to read a bunch of stuff I don't need? So you don't bring the whole row group in. You bring the header in. And you say, okay, here's the offsets now of where my attributes are. And then I can go ahead and fetch those. Actually, here you can see. Here, here's the, the you see the footer here. This is instead of the header saying the metadata what's in here, like the file row group and column metadata, like where the, where the offsets are. Instead of the header, it's it's just in the footer for Parquet, and Orc is the same way. All right, so as we said multiple times, I/O has always been the main bottleneck we have, uh, especially for analytical queries. And if we assume the data is uncompressed, that means like the you know the, whatever the exact size of a tuple for in, in you know in, in a table, you know every page is going to bring exactly that da that data in, um, and so the most obvious way to reduce the well in, to speed up queries you can you can you can basically skip data or you can make the data you do fetch bring more things into memory. So skipping data is, is what the column store stuff helps with because you avoid having to read read attributes you don't need. Compression is another way to say, okay, for every page I fetch, I get more tuples than I would if it was uncompressed. Now, there's going to be this trade-off between uh, speed up and the compression ratio. Obviously, disk is, is going to be potentially slower than CPU, especially in the cloud setting. And so I'm willing to pay the extra cost of having to decompress and compress data because now, again, it'll, it'll reduce my the amount of IOPS I'm, or the amount of time I'm wasting on IOPS to, bring, to fetch things in. Um, it, it, things are slightly getting uh, the sort of the, the difference between disk speed and CPU speed is getting uh, the distance is getting smaller. Where in some cases disk is actually getting so fast lately, where maybe you don't want things to be compressed. There'll be some other benefits we'll see in a second. Where if you do keep things compressed, the data system actually can run faster uh, when it actually processes things in memory, and we'll cover that uh, in a few weeks. But in general, for most systems, compressing things on disk is, is always going to be a win. So any compression scheme we need to use has to produce fixed length values, as we said before, because if we want to store this in a column store, uh, we want to make sure that we always have fixed length offsets. Um, in some cases, too, we want to delay when we actually decompress things for as long as possible while we execute queries. And we'll see this again. We'll talk about this more when we talk about query execution. But the idea here is that if I have a bunch of these, these one megabyte strings uh, that, that are in my table, but I can, I can convert them to 32-bit integers. I want to process 32-bit integers for as long as possible because I have to copy data from one operator to the next as, as I execute the query. I can, or if it's a distributed system copied over the network, I want to keep things compressed as long as possible and only decompress it when I actually have to show something back to that something needs it to be decompressed or the user needs the output. Joins makes that, makes that harder, harder, but we'll cover, cover that later in a second. And then the obvious most important thing we need for any compression scheme in our data system is we need to ensure that we're using a lossless scheme. And we know what that means. Lossy versus lossless. Yes. Right. There's no information loss when you compress things, right? Or decompress them, right? So a, a, a lossy scheme would be like MP3, MP4, JPEG, right? Where they're doing some tricks about how the human perceives, you know, audio data or visual data to compress things down to a, a much smaller size. And so that means, like, if you have the raw image you took or the raw sound file you took, when you compress it, you're not going to get back the same, the same values, if you will, when you decompress it. We don't want to do that in a database system because, well, as we said before, people don't like losing data, right? If you, know, if you have $100 in your bank account and then they compress the data and when it gets decompressed and now you have you know, $90, you're going to notice, you're going to complain, right? So typically, you know, most systems will not use a, a lossy scheme just because you know, it, it, it will have problems. You can do lossy compression yourself, right? So think of like, I, I, I mean, like the application could do this. Like, if I have um, a keeping track of the temperature of this room every second, right, and I do this for, for 10 years, do I really need to know what the exact temperature was at a, you know, at a one second interval, you know, a year from now? No, I can maybe compress it down to here's the average temperature per minute, right? So I can't get back the original data because it's been compressed uh, or aggregated, and that might be okay. But again, that's something you, as a user in the application, a human has to know whether that's an okay thing to do. The database system doesn't. Therefore, the database system is always going to be using a lossless scheme. 
So now the question is, you know, what do we actually want to compress? And there's, there's a couple of different choices. One is we can compress a single page or a block of data. Uh, so that's all the tuples within the same table. We can compress a, a single tuple by itself if it's a, a row store system. Um, we can go even more fine grained than that. We can say, I'll compress within one tuple one single attribute and compress that. Um, so think of like the overflow tables we said before. If you're, st if you're storing you know, huge uh, you know, text, text attributes, or like in Wikipedia, the revisions, it's the, you know, it could be a lot of, a lot of text. Um, like, I forget what the largest Wikipedia article is. I think it's like something with Star Wars, right? So, like, that's, a, you know, there could be kilobytes of text data. And I could compress just for that, you know, that one entry. Um, and Postgres did this, and a bunch of other systems do this. Or, alternatively, I could compress for a single column if, it, if it's a column source system. So, let's talk about how you could do this for at the block level. Um, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about how to do this at the column level, because that, that matters the most for uh, in a columnar system. So to do it at a block level, we, we essentially need to use a naive compression scheme. And by naive, I mean that the, it's, it's, the database system is making a call to like a third-party library, like gzip. You wouldn't want to use that because it's slow, but it's a third-party library that's going to take the page and then compress it down to some binary form where the database system has no way to interpret or, or any, can do any introspection into the compressed version of, of the block, right? Again, so I call, you know, uh, call gzip on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a file. The data system doesn't know how to go read inside that compressed file, right? It has to decompress it in order to, in order to get back the original version of it, right? So again, you wouldn't want to use gzip. There's a bunch of these faster alternatives. Uh, and that sort of all came out with L LZO, was, was a sort of big great breakthrough in the, in the 1990s. Z standard is considered the state-of-the-art compression scheme now um, from Facebook. They're actually working on a new version. It's not public yet. Um, it's, it's even faster and better, uh, but that's not out yet. Uh, but Z standard is what you should be using. So let's see how MySQL does this. So MySQL, actually, you, you can support uh, table compression. You declare it on a per table basis. It's, I don't think it's owned by default. And the way it works is that all your, your pages, when they're written to disk, they're going to be compressed into, uh, into some multi a, a page size that's going to be some multiple of, 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 of four or two up to eight kilobytes. Right? And then each page, they're going to have a header portion called the mod log where it's, it's sort of like the, the row store thing I mentioned before, where I can do a bunch of writes and make changes to the page without having to decompress it first, right? So it's like a little extra space in the beginning. And obviously also too, say like, say your, if your page is uh, like, when, after it's compressed, it's six kilobytes, they'll pad it up to the next highest value within you know, one, two, four, eight. And this ensures that you can have, uh, you don't have any fragmentation in, in your layout on disk. And when, and when you bring things into memory. All right, so say I, I a query runs and wants to read something in page zero, right? If I'm doing a blind write, like an insert or a delete uh, or even update, assuming I have the values, I don't need to decompress the page. I just write that change to the mod log. And again, it's just log structure like we talked about before. I said we were going to see this idea throughout the rest of the semester, right? You can think of the mod log as just the log structure storage we talked about before. And in some cases, too, I can do reads on the mod log, because if the data I need was just inserted and, and it's in the mod log, I don't have to decompress the rest of the, the page. But then if I do need to read the page, they'll, they'll decompress it, store it as a regular 16-kilobyte uh, page in, in memory in their buffer pool, because that's the default size for, for MySQL. And then I can do whatever reads I want on that. right? But I still keep the compressed version around. And I think also, too, when it gets decompressed, they apply the changes to the mod log to, to the page there. Right? Is this, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Postgres doesn't do this. Yes? I would say for reading, it's not super great. You said for reading, it's not super great. Why? Not necessarily, like if, if, like going back here, if I do an insert, 
and it lands in the mod log, right? I don't have to decompress it. My index, like there's some bookkeeping they're doing saying, okay, like I updated the index now, so the record ID points to this page, and, and then you, you look in the mod log, oh, the, for that slot number, or that, that record ID, it's really in the mod log, not the full page. So you don't have to decompress it. All right, I'll say, I actually think it's a decent idea. And, uh, and I say Postgres doesn't do it, not because, like, oh, Postgres, like Postgres is not the gospel, right? If Postgres doesn't, doesn't do something, doesn't mean like you shouldn't be doing it. Postgres is actually an amazing front end. The back end is actually pretty terrible, right? Because uh, a lot of the design is remnants from, from the 1980s, and it's not how you would build a modern system today. So, and they don't support compression for for pages, you know, for regular data pages like this, only for toast tables, the, the overflow pages. So this is actually a decent idea, right? It does have some challenges though, right? Uh, the because my SQL is a row store, the that's why you have to use a naive compression scheme because you can't do anything fancy because the, the values you're storing for all, in, in the tuples themselves, or sorry, the, in the page itself, from all the different attributes, and you're not going to be able to do all the native compression scheme we'll see in a second, right? And again, because we're just using, I think they use Snappy or, or, or Z standard, because you're using a general purpose compression algorithm, the data system doesn't know how to interpret what those compressed, version, the compressed bytes actually mean. And the spoiler is, all those compression algorithms I talked about before, they're basically doing some variant of, of dictionary compression. Right? It's going to build its own dictionary of repeated byte, byte sequences. But again, MySQL doesn't know how to read that, that dictionary. And so it has to decompress the whole thing. So for some workloads, I think this, 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 this is actually a good idea. And I kind of wish Postgres did, did do some compression. All right, so if we're doing OLAP, uh, ideally, we want to be able to, to run our query directly on the compressed data without having to decompress it first. Right? So say something like, like this. I have my salary and DJ2PL salary. Right? Assuming I have some compression algorithm. I'm not saying what it is. And then I have a compressed form of the, of the, of the database. Well, if my query shows up, or I want to get my salary, I do some kind of magic that converts the query uh, to, to convert this constant string, Andy, into the compressed form. And then now I can do a direct lookup on my compressed table using my compressed constant and not have to decompress every single page as I'm going along. Now I'm, getting, I'm, I'm going to reduce the amount of I.O. I have to do because I'm fetching in compressed pages. I don't have to decompress them in order to do lookups into them. So this is ideally what we want. And the easiest way to do this is going to be in a columnar system. So this is just sort of a quick overview of a bunch of different compression algorithms you could possibly have. Um, again, the, the spoiler is going to be dictionary compression and dictionary encoding is the default choice for most systems. Um, but what you can do, you, you, can, you may not want to compress a, a, a single column using these other schemes. We'll, we'll see, see some examples where it does make sense. But after you do dictionary encoding, you can apply all the, these other compression schemes on the dictionary itself or your, still, your dictionary encoded values and get even further compression. So you can get sort of a multiplicative effect where you do compression one way, and then you run another compression algorithm on the compressed data and get even better compression. And it's still done in a way where the data system can natively interpret what those bytes actually mean in the compressed form without having to decompress it first. And again, this is why you want the data system to do everything, do everything and don't want the OS to do anything or anybody else to do anything. Uh, because, again, because we can do native, uh, this native compression. All right, so let's, let's do some quick examples here. So one approach to do is it's called run length encoding, or RLE. And this is, the basic idea here is that if we have uh, contiguous uh, runs of, of values that are the same thing, or literally the same value, instead of storing that value over and over again for every single tuple, I'll instead store a compressed summary that says, for this value at this offset, uh, here's how many how many occurrences it has, right? Now this works great if your data is sorted based on whatever the column you're trying to compress. Uh, it, you can't always do this, uh, but again, if you sort things, then you can you can maximize the amount of uh, uh, the, the maximize the repeated runs. Let's say I, I have a single table where it has an ID field and then has a column that says whether somebody's dead or not, yes or no, right? It's yes or no. There's there's no null. There's no maybe, right? Uh, so we, we can compress this guy here. 
right? So a compressed form would just take, essentially just scanning through the column and finding the you know, contiguous attributes or contiguous tuples that have the same value and then converting it into this triplet that says, here's the value, we're at this offset, and here's the size of the run. All right? And so now, if I have a query comes along, like uh, count the number of people that are, that are dead versus not dead, right? I can just rip through that is dead column uh, and compute my aggregation by just summing up the, the, the length of the run, you know, and then along with the, 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 the value there. I actually can do even better, right? So I had this little, this little part here where I have somebody's not dead, and then they're dead, and then not dead, right? So I have now these, these three triplets here where the, the run size is one. So in this case here, I'm actually doing worse because I'm, I'm storing a triplet when I could just store a single value by itself, right? So if I sort the data based on whether somebody's dead or not, now my RLE compression only has, you know, the compressed column only has two entries. Here's all the dead people and here's all the non-dead people. And this greatly reduces the, uh, you know, the, the amount of data I have to store now. So it may be the case, again, say I have, always think of it as extremes. My example is because I, I have to fit them on the slides. You know, I'm having, I have ten, eight, eight or nine tuples here. If I have a billion tuples or a billion people, I can compress now down, you know, keeping track of like, you know, who's of a billion people is dead or not dead into a small number of bytes. And that'll fit on one page. You need the length uh, in the triplet because, because again, assuming that we always have fixed length offsets, this allows you to figure out, okay, like if, if I need to find for a single tuple, a single entry, is there, are they dead or not? Like it allows you to do the math to, just, to reverse it back and say, okay, I would be at this offset if I was uncompressed. And that, that's just simple arithmetic. Another compression scheme you can do is called bit packing. And the idea here is that people oftentimes declare attributes or, or columns in a, a certain type that is larger than they actually need. So an idea would be like if I have a column where I'm keeping track of some number and I declare it as, a, as, a, as an integer type. That's in, in SQL, that's a, it's a 32-bit integer. So that means that even if the, no matter if, if it's a small value, I'm still going to allocate 32 bits to store it, right? So for these numbers here, none of them are very big, uh, but I'm always going to store it as 32 bits. So in this case here, to store these, these eight or nine numbers, it's eight numbers, I have to store 26 bits. But again, the only thing that matters is actually these lower portion of the bits here, because this is, this, is you know, this is the actual data that I need, right? All this other stuff, the, all, you know, other, the other... Uh, the, the other 24 bits is just waste of space, right? So instead what I can do is, even though you've declared it as a 32-bit integer, I'm going to store it as an 8-bit integer. And then now that greatly reduces the size down uh, you know, by a factor of 4. So I was able to go, again, from 26 bits to, to 64 bits. And you can do a bunch of tricks with bit shifting operators and SIMD, which we can talk about later in the semester, to actually now... You know, as, as I'm scanning along and saying, trying to find like you know matches on a certain number, because these are now 8-bit integers, I can put them into a single 32-bit uh, integer, and I'm keeping track of inside my system. Oh, it's it's really at this offset. It's, it's, it's these different values, and then with now with a single CPU instruction, I can operate on four 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 values at once. What's the problem with this? Yes. Boom. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So his statement is, well, what happens if I have a number that can't be stored in those 8 bits that I'm trying to pack them into, right? And so the way you get around this is a technique from Amazon for Redshift. It's called mostly encoding, where you say, the, the idea is basically to say, most of the data in my column is going to be small enough. But in the cases where it's not, they, they'll keep track of that and then store that as a separate, uh, in a dictionary, right? So again, I have these 32-bit 32, 32 numbers. But I have, so I have this one 9999 here that's really big. So I'll store, still store them as, as, as 8 bits, but then I'll, I'll have a special marker value. Think of like all the bits are set to 1. And then uh, I have a separate table that says, for a given offset, here's, the, here's what the original value should be. 
So now as, I, as, I, as I'm scanning along this, this column, if I see my special marker value, I know that I should look in this offset table and find out what the real value should have been. Yes? Can you also do something similar with, with the, um, like the, the triplets where you just like say the next couple things are four bits, so then the next couple are eight, or the next couple are 32 bits? Yeah, so the statement is, couldn't you do something with like the triplets where instead of just saying everything's always eight bits, could you say, ah, oh, you know, I have a thousand values that are contiguous that are, you store them as four bits, then I can store them in as, as, as you know, 12 bits or whatever. So that, going back to the packs thing, because they break it up into row groups, each row group could have its own compression scheme. So you could do something like that. Uh, I think Parquet is more, Parquet is more aggressive compression than, than Orc. It's, it's, more, it's more complicated. Or, or maybe the other way around. One of them does, one of them is very simple. One of them does, has a bunch of the, the various tricks you're talking about. All right, so in this example here, the original size is 256 bits, but then if I do m the mostly encoding, uh, I just have to store 8 by 8 bits to, uh, for the, the mostly 8 column, and then assuming that I only need 16 bits for the offset and the 32 bits for the value uh, for this lookup table, which is not true because you obviously allocate more um, for additional metadata, but assuming you get it down to that, it's 112 bits. So that's pretty good. Another trick you can do is called bitmap encoding. And the idea here is that if you have an attribute that has low cardinality, meaning has a, has a small number of unique values, where now instead of storing for every single tuple uh, in, in a column, here's the actual value, what I'm instead going to do is maintain bitmaps, where I have one bitmap for every possible value I could have in the column, and the bit is set to 1 based on whether the, the column or the attribute, the tuple at that offset, it has that particular value, right? So there are some database systems that, that provide bitmap indexes that essentially give the same things. So you still have the original column, but then they maintain bitmap indexes that'll do the same technique that we're seeing here. Um, there's a system, there's a company that's going to come talk about their data system later this semester. Called, I think it's called, it's, there's, there's, it's either feature base or feature form. There's two different databases that have the same name feature in them. One of them only stores bitmap indexes. They don't, you can't actually store real data or the, the, the base data. All right, so the idea is here. So say we go back to our, our is dead column, right? Again, there's only two possible values, either dead or not dead. So instead of storing, again, the actual single values themselves, I have two bitmaps. One says uh, for yes, one says, says no. Um, and then there's a bit here that's, that's set in each bitmap that corresponds to whether the, the original value has that that bitmap or not, or it has that particular value or not, right? So I only need now uh, two 8 bits, or right, 16 bits to store the, the yes or no, and then now my bitmap is just uh, you know, 18 bits, right? Because I have nine values and I need two bits each. So I can get this down now to 34 bits. What's an obvious problem with this approach? Yes? He said, his, if your data is high cardinality, this is a terrible idea. And indeed, yes, it is. Let's look at an example. So let's say we have a customer table like this, and we have, and we have the zip code column, right? How many zip codes are, are in the United States? I'm going to guess. I hear 10,000, no, more. 100,000 less. For now, we're doing binary search. <laughs> it's 43,000, right? Assume we have a table with, with 10 million rows, and I'm going to build a bitmap for every single unique possible zip code I have, well, I'm going to need, uh, well, just to store the data, assuming we, the raw data, assuming we can store the zip code as 32 bits, the raw data is 40 megabytes, but if I had to have a 10 million size bitmap uh, for every single uh, zip code, now we're at 50, you know, 53 gigs, right? So clearly, th this is a bad idea. Um, furthermore, every time somebody adds a new tuple, uh, I have to extend that bitmap because I, you know, because the offsets have to match. I keep adding more, you know, to it. So I have to do that for every possible bitmap, right? So bitmap indexes can make a huge difference, but it's really for like when you have a really small number card now, like like less than maybe ten. Uh, you'd want to do this. And then again, m most systems don't do this by default. All right, delta coding. The idea here is that if the values from one attribute to, to the next from one tuple to the next, sorry, uh, if they're close enough to each other, 
maybe again, I don't need to store the entire value uh, uh, for, for one tuple. I just need to store the, the difference of the delta between the previous value. So let's say again, I, I have a, some kind of sensor reading where I'm keeping track of the temperature in the room, and every minute I'm, 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 sto I'm storing the temperature, right? So in this timestamp column here, assuming that we're storing it at 64 bits, uh, we know that the time is always going to be incre incre incrementing by one. And furthermore, assuming I'm keeping track of the temperature you know, in the room or outside, from one minute to the next, there's not going to be dramatic temperature swings. Right? We're not going to go from like you know, 99 degrees to 0 degrees within, within a minute. And so what I can just do now is to store you know, from one tuple to the next, what was the difference between the, the previous one here? Right? So in, the, in, the, in case of the, the timestamp, it's just plus 1, adding a minute. Uh, in case of the temperature, it's, it's some you know, fractional, uh, there's a decimal difference between the previous one. I can compress this even further now. Because what do I have a, what, in this first column here at the timestamp? What do I have? A bunch of plus ones. How can we compress that? Run length encoding, right? So we can compress this even further now and convert this into, uh, you know, convert the, the combination of, of the, the 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 delta encoding and the run length encoding to tell you how many plus ones I have afterwards. All right, so this is a good example where, again, we can have this multiplicative effect where we can compress the compressed data even further because we're putting it into a form that's, 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 uh, that can take advantage of it. So if you go back to our original data size, uh, just for the timestamp column itself, we were at 320 bits. But if we do the depth encoding followed by the, the RLE encoding, we can get it down to 96 bits. Again, I'm showing six or seven tuples here. It's not that big. But again, think of it extreme. Think of like if I have a, a billion records. This would be a massive savings. All right, the last one discussed is dictionary compression. Because again, I said this is the most common one. This is how we're going to get. Uh, this is how most systems are, are going to compress data, even for things that aren't strings, right? Uh, in some cases, there are some uh, columnar systems will compress integer data, or float data, and putting them to, 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 to dictionary codes. All right, the idea here is that if we have values that we, or that we see over and over again, instead of storing that value repeatedly for in, within a column, we're going to convert that into some 32-bit integer. And then we maintain a, a mapping data structure, the dictionary, that knows how to take that, that dictionary code, the 32-bit integer, and convert it back into an original value. Typically, we're going to have it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. For, for one value, we'll have one dictionary code. There is some techniques. I don't think any commercial system does this, where you can say, I have, if I see multiple attributes, uh, the, the, the patterns together, I'll convert the combination, the two of them, or three of them, into a single dictionary code to get even further compression. But I, I, again, I, I, it's, oh, I've only seen that in the academic literature. And then we need a way to do fast encoding and decoding on the fly that, that allows to do both uh, range and point queries. So point queries are obvious. Like, I want to be able to say, you know, the string Andy maps to you know, code 101. I know how to do the exact lookups on those. But ideally, I want to be able to also be able to do range queries on compressed data. And so I want my dictionary codes to have the same uh, ordering that the original values actually did too. And we'll see how to do that in a second. So say this is my original data, a bunch of names of my former students. Uh, then the uh, compressed version of this could be Again, in, I have my original column convert those into 32-bit uh, integers, and then I just have this this mapping table here that converts the or allows me to look up to say for a given code what's the original value, or for a given original value what's what's the code, and that's the dictionary. So now we can go back to my example that I had in the very beginning with me and DJ Two PL, where select star from users where name equals Andy, I can convert the the string Andy into uh, the dictionary code by doing a lookup first in the dictionary, then now I scan through my my column and just do lookups or do do uh, comparisons based on the integers. So I don't need to go through as I'm scanning along. If I don't do if I don't compress my my constant, then as I scan along, I gotta go decompress each of these one by one and then do my lookups. I'm basically getting, losing all the benefit of any of compression, right? And that's what MySQL has to do, because they can't interpret what's actually in the dictionary. They can't interpret what's, what the compressed bytes actually mean. But in this case here, because we're the data system, we, we built the dictionary. We control it. We know how to read it and, and interpret it. 
we can, I mean, and it's SQL, so we know what the query wants to do. We know how to take that constant, convert it to the dictionary code, then, then do our scan directly on the compressed data. So how do we actually do this, uh, do the encoding and decoding, right? Well, again, for a given, given uncompressed value, we know how to, way to go, go get compressed form and then reverse it. So the key thing to point out is there's not going to be a magic hash function that can do this for us, right? Uh, any reversible hash function uh, is, is, is going to generate something that's going to be much larger likely than the original value, or certainly not get it down to a 32-bit integer, right? So we're going to have to build a data structure that, that we maintain that allows us to do this. And as I said, we want something that's going to be preserve the ordering of the original values such that the compressed data, the compressed dictionary codes, those things have the same ordering uh, lexicographically or, or, yeah, as the original data does. So going back here, right, if I have, again, I have a bunch of these names, I want my, uh, I want the dictionary that I'm generating to, to the codes to have this, such that if one, if the original value comes before in the, in, the, in the ordering before another original value, its dictionary code should come before it as well. So I would have a, I, my, my dictionary is basically sorted. So now this allows me to do queries like this. Select star from users were named like Andy, A and D, followed by the wildcard. And so if we operate directly on the compressed data, we can convert this like clause into a between clause because we can look up in the dictionary run the, the like portion just on the dictionary uh, values, find the, the ones that match, find the, the min and max values for the matching uh, values, and then rewrite the like into a between clause, and then now rip through my column in, while it's still compressed. Again, we can do this because it's, it's SQL. We know, what the, we know what's in the where clause. It's not arbitrary Python code or C code. We know exactly what the, what the, what the where clause wants to do. And we can be smart, intelligent, and convert this into, uh, you know, do, do the rewriting for us. And again, you as the, 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 the application programmer, or not you guys, but like some JavaScript programmer, they don't have to know what the hell's up going underneath the covers, right? They just write the like clause, and the data system can be, the, can be smart and, and re rewrite it for you and get better performance. So in some cases here, you still have to do uh, the question is whether you you know still to perform an original column. In this case here, since I need the um, I need the output of of the of, of the name attribute, I still have to go rip through the column uh, and actually and actually look at them. In some cases, though, the data system can even be even smarter and it can answer queries without actually looking at the the compressed data, but just operate directly on the on the dictionary. So instead of saying select name from users. If it was distinct name from users, where I don't need to get the actual tuples themselves, I just need to get the actual values that are unique, then for this query here, after I do my conversion to the, uh, you know, converting to, to the between, or convert the, this, this wildcard here into the, the dictionary values, I only need to know what, what values actually exist in the dictionary. And I don't need to go look at the actual column. For this query here, uh, with the distinct, you know, assuming I only have four names in my, in my table, but I have a billion rows, I only need to look at four rows in, in the dictionary to answer it. And again, I've said this multiple times, we can do this because the data, because the data system is, is responsible for compressing this. Now, Parquet and Orc, one of the big limitations that they have is they don't actually expose the dictionary to you uh, when you use their, their libraries and utilities. So you can't do this trick I'm talking about here if you're using Parquet and Orc, right? Parquet and Orc will decompress the data when it gives it back to you. You can't operate directly on compressed data. And that's actually one of the biggest limitations of, in my, my opinion, of those two formats. But again, other systems that do native compression without Parquet and Orc can, can, can do this trick. All right, so what, what is the data structure, what, you know, what, what, what is the data structure we're going to use for our dictionary? So the most common approach is going to be a really simple array. And this works great if the, if the files are immutable because I build the array once and I never have to resize things and, and insert things in, in, in place and, and different, to, to move things around. I can just build it once and I'm done. If you need something that's dynamic and can support updates, you need either a hash table or a B plus tree. These are, the uh, hash table is, is I think, less common. There is, 
Actually, these things are less common. Most people do the array and, and assume the, the blocks are going to be, uh, the compressed blocks are going to be immutable. And only if I need to, to, to rebuild it, then I'll rebuild the array. And I realize I'm over time. Let me show roughly what it looks like. So basically, you have your original data in your column. So the first thing you need to do is, is build your dictionary. And again, all that's going to be is a sorted list of the, of the values you have. And then the, um, and you store the length of the, of the, um, of the string. And then now the dictionary code is going to be is just an offset into this, this array here. So my compressed data would look, look like this. And these are just offsets, the byte offset into the array. And so now when I'm doing a scan and I want to say, okay, if, if I, if I have, um, if I, if that's the second one, the second entry, it's 17. I jump to byte uh, offset at 17, and I can look in the, uh, that's down here. I can look in the, in the header and tell me how big is the string afterwards. All right, so the dictionary itself is literally just an array packed of bytes like that. Okay? All right, so to finish up, the, we, you know, this row store versus column store is going to be really important, and we'll see this show up when we talk about query execution and other things, um, mostly before, before the midterm. Because again, the, the distinction or the difference between a row store and a column store system have ramifications through, throughout all other parts of the database system. How you do recovery, how you could do query execution, how you want to run transactions, uh, so how you want to optimize your queries. And so it's really important to understand this now, and we'll, we'll, we'll see the trade-offs between the two approaches again and again throughout the entire semester. And then most database systems, to get the best compression ratio, you want to do it natively. You want to do it yourself. Uh, and dictionary coding is the most common one. So I showed this uh, three, three lectures ago. That there were sort of two problems in database storage. First, how are we going to represent data on disk? We've covered that so far. So starting uh, next week, now we're talking about, OK, when we bring things into memory, what do we do with it? How do we store it? And how do we write things back out safely when, when we make changes? OK? All right, hit it. This shit is gangsta. <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> that boy's a gangsta. <laughs> you ain't nothing but a gangsta. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 to send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.